So here in Australia, we are well and truly the land of the skinks. In our white skink video, we mentioned that there's over 370 different species of skink here in Australia. But when it comes to the big skinks, the things that most people think about are going to be blue tongue lizards and shingleback skinks. But this guy here, the Cunningham skink, is every bit as big and equally as fascinating. And this is the lizard we're going to talk about in today's video. So Cunningham skinks are distant cousins to the blue tongues. They're not quite in the same family, but they are related. But these guys do have a very different lifestyle to the blue tongue skinks and the shingleback skinks and things like this. First off, unlike his cousins, these guys are actually a social species. They live in a colony made up of a bunch of pairs and all their offspring. But on top of that, these guys are saxicolous. So whereas blue tongues and shinglebacks found on the ground, open habitats, things like this, these guys are dependent on rocky outcrops to make a living. They use these rocky outcrops because they provide an abundance of basking sites, places to eat, places to warm up. But on top of that, they rely on these rocky outcrops and all the cracks and crevices to hide in. In fact, these guys are perfectly built for hiding amongst the cracks and crevices in rocks. You see, when these guys are living out in their rocks and they're basking, they're out in the open, if they see anything go overhead, a bird, anything that could be a predator, these guys duck for cover. And they're a fair bit quicker than their blue tongue and shingleback cousins. But once they get to cover, a little crack, a little crevice, these guys are covered with spines. And each spine along their whole body point backwards. Now this means when they get in a crevice head first, all those spines stick backwards, you cannot pull them out. These guys wedge themselves in like Velcro. And it means it's a really good way to avoid predation. Being a social species, these guys have also developed a few interesting habits and features that their non-social cousins lack. The first one is that when living in a colony, these guys actually use designated toileting sites. So they'll seek out the same spot over and over to go to the toilet rather than leaving their business all over the colony. On top of that, it turns out that these guys have the ability to determine whether another cutting out skink is related or unrelated. Now this isn't like the white skink to necessarily kick out and defend from unrelated lizards. It's actually because these guys will deliberately seek out unrelated cutting ham skinks to breed with. Even when these guys are landlocked by habitat loss and things like this, most species would become more and more inbred. Cutting ham skinks on the other hand, seem to still continue to seek out unrelated lizards to mate with, maintaining a level of genetic diversity that some other lizards might not be able to do. How they do this is still a mystery, but it's an incredibly interesting thing. Once they find their unrelated lizard Romeo or Juliet, it turns out that the Cunningham skin, just like their shingleback cousin, is also monogamous. So a colony will be made up of many, many different pairs, but the pairs won't necessarily interbreed with each other. Genetic studies have shown that the same pair will breed year after year, despite the presence of all these other Cunningham skinks sharing the same home. These pairs mate each spring, and about three to four months later, they give birth to live young. They have between four and 11 live babies who will be included into the colony that they're born in. So these guys stay in that parental group after they're born. And these guys are also omnivores. Just like a lot of our other skinks, they'll eat both plant and animal material. As these guys are born, they're largely insectivorous. They eat anything that moves past them. And the bigger they get, the more and more plant material they eat. By the time they're fully grown, like Prickle here, about 90% of their diet is gonna be plant material. So she'll eat things like flower petals, uh, leaves, seeds, anything that she can find, and the odd insect. As far as their distribution goes, these guys are found throughout Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and into South Australia. And this wide distribution does, to an extent, protect them from endangerment. The sad thing is, though, these guys, like we mentioned, are dependent on these rocky outcrops to live in. And this means in certain areas, these guys are under threat. The issue that we have is when people go to build a house or they want to plant a crop in a paddock, we pick up all the rocks and we get rid of them. The strange thing as far as building houses go is a lot of people today mean well and they say, let's build a habitat for animals here. So after they've got rid of all the rocks, built their house, they say, well, let's build a garden. We'll go to the shops and we'll buy a heap of rocks. And those rocks often come from nursery companies who collect them from a couple of hours out of town. And it means that within a couple of hours of certain towns and areas, these guys have lost all of that surface rock that they need to hide under. Now, while they're listed as secure in the eastern half of their population, over in South Australia, their populations in the Adelaide Hills are listed as vulnerable. Some small populations have been isolated and others have disappeared entirely. But it means that this guy's actually listed 
as a threatened species in at least one part of their range. This is, however, a great example of how important not only large habitats are, but the microhabitats within an environment that certain animals need. We don't just need to protect the forest, we need to protect the rocky outcrops within the forest. And ways that we can do this is we can not collect rocks out of them. There's plenty of rocks that get pulled out of paddocks for cropping and things like this that can fill the nursery industry. They might just not be the shade or colour we want. And you know what? We can deal with that. On top of that, it's a great example of why we shouldn't take rocks home for ourselves or stack rocks. Suddenly you'll turn what used to be a colony into a single unit. So we don't want to be stacking rocks, collecting rocks. We want to leave that bush exactly how it is so that my kids and your kids and our grandkids can grow up and see Cunningham skinks in the wild as they belong. With all things said and done, while this lizard is threatened in one part of their range, overall they seem to be surviving pretty well despite the fact that their distribution includes much of the most occupied places in all of Australia. So hopefully these guys are going to be around for a lot longer to come. But despite that, most Australians don't know much about them. And that's why I thought we'd talk about them today. So I hope that you've learnt something. I hope that you've enjoyed listening to us talk about the interesting Cunningham skink. And if you haven't already, please hit the like button, the subscribe, leave a comment, all that sort of stuff. And uh, if you want to see more wildlife content, Check on back next week, guys. There's plenty more to come. But between now and then, be nice to wildlife. Have a good one and take care.